Um, what I'm going to do today, I just uh, sort of an outline of uh, what I had been asked to do, and then I'll sort of walk you through where we're going to go. I'm going to give you a little bit of the historical perspective of uh, EPA uh, activities over the years, and it has been quite a, an extensive um, uh, interaction with uh, inorganic arsenic, uh, primarily in the drinking water, primarily focused on cancer endpoints, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I think it's important that people understand what this process is uh, with the National Research Council, what it is not, and I'll, I'll go through that. Uh, a lot of the issues that have been identified that are critical for this IRIS assessment. Does everybody know what the IRIS is? Integrated Risk Information System. It is the EPA's uh, process for bringing disparate information together to come up with a risk assessment. So I will use that acronym a lot. Um, these are the lists of the, of the things that the committee has identified are important um, ways to begin to focus the discussion. What are the potential health outcomes of exposure to inorganic arsenic? Uh, what are the metabolism disposition, distribution, uh, exposure issues? I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That happens to be one of my particular areas of focus. Mode of action analyses as well, dose response considerations. And I'll introduce the concept of these susceptible populations considerations that some of the questions that you just heard um, uh, were addressing. And I think we'll introduce what uh, Megan is going to talk about, uh, Dr. Hall is going to talk about uh, in a moment. Uh, in the course of this, I, I will try to, and if I forget, Sam, please help me remember, uh, to tell you what is a National Academy, what is an NRC position, and what is my own position. Uh, as you would imagine, with a big group like this, there are differences of opinion and I will try to make that uh, distinction. Um, and then finally, I'll end up, what are the next steps uh, for the process? Uh, so first of all, my disclaimer, um, as Sam introduced you, what am I doing up here talking about arsenic? I spent 35 years in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I think that I am on the committee and I have uh, exercised this role as somebody who is experienced, I consider myself a reasonable expert in human risk assessment from chemical exposure. Uh, and so in that regard, it's, it's an interesting uh, perspective in this committee that I'll introduce to you in a minute uh, of experts uh, in arsenic. Um, the views that I will express I think will uh, be mine. Uh, I have taken care to make sure that all of these slides have been reviewed with the NRC group overseeing it as well as the chair of our committee and they have both uh, endorsed that. Um, and um, I will, as I said, attempt to make clear what their positions are if they differ uh, from mine. And finally, uh, Ilse has asked that we uh, talk about affiliations. I am not affiliated with any organization that can in any way be impacted, I don't think, by the uh, upcoming uh, IRIS assessment. Let me introduce you to the committee. Uh, it's chaired by Dr. Joe Graziano at Columbia. Uh, if the, you will see, I'm not going to go through all of these people, but you will see <clears throat> on this list, if you're familiar with the arsenic area, people like uh, Joe, Habib, Hassan, uh, the next slide, uh, Anna Navas Asian, people who have spent their careers in uh, the arsenic field uh, as epidemiologists, understanding the relationship between exposure in uh, areas like Bangladesh, uh, Taiwan, uh, Chile, and some of these really significant health outcomes that are associated with these very high exposures. And I think people like Joe have been responsible for institution of changes in those areas that have really improved health outcomes uh, for uh, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people in that area. But they are, their background is epidemiology. There are other people, Aaron Barshowski at, at Pittsburgh, who's uh, a very good uh, mechanistic pharmacologist who has been very helpful in these discussions. Yvonne Dragon and I are probably the only ones that don't have published experience in our state, maybe Gary Carlson as well, or Hugh Barton. Yvonne drafted the mode of action section in the report that I'll talk about in a minute, and she has been very instrumental in this process. Uh, the rest of the group, um, Rebecca Fry has also been quite uh, active and quite helpful in understanding um, uh, cellular uh, modes of action uh, uh, with endpoints like genomics, looking at uh, arsenic action in, uh, in different systems. Uh, people who have hands-on experience using EPA IRIS numbers to try to do something with them in a community, and that has been quite uh, a, uh, an important and interesting um, session for me to see how, how that happens. Uh, and I talked about Anna Navas-Asien, 
Uh, Marie has been quite um, active in publishing on metabolism and distribution uh, and has contributed importantly to these discussions. So this is, uh, that's the group. So this is the, the timetable. As I said, this has been going on for quite a while. Uh, the initial iris assessment for inorganic arsenic was conducted in 1988 by EPA and it was reviewed in 1999 for the first time by the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council. Um, in 2001, the NRC updated their 1990 report and started to focus on the growing body uh, and very compelling body of epidemiology data that uh, were becoming available. Um, and at this time, in 2001, this is where this 10 ppb level, 10 micrograms per liter, was established as the maximum permissible level in drinking water. Um, in 2003, the EPA took up reassessment of this level based on the growing body of data that uh, were becoming available. They submitted their recommendations to the Science Advisory Board for EPA in 2005. Uh, 2007, the Science Advisory Board released the report. And the EPA uh, released their draft updated IRIS report. And importantly, it focused on cancer endpoints only, only on the, the cancer endpoints after exposure to organic arsenic. Um, and the SEB re released their reports in 2011. The U.S. Congress uh, wasn't satisfied with the approaches that were taken by the EPA in that process, and they asked the, they mandated that EPA contract with the National Academy of Science to have the NRC review the process, and it's really the process, it's not necessarily the science, and I'll talk about the process in a minute, but to review the process by which EPA goes through to assess uh, potential human health risks to exposure to inorganic arsenic, all exposure. So it excluded, uh, the report that we did excludes um, inhalation and excludes dermal, but it's oral exposure, food, and water. Um, and they drafted, uh, they mandated this IRIS review. Here's the statement of the task <coughs> that um, came out of um, the congressional mandate uh, that an ad hoc NRC a committee would be uh, established and would conduct a workshop to review all of the appropriate uh, literature, including as broad a stakeholder uh, population as possible. And that workshop was held uh, um, in 2000, in, uh, on April 4th last year. It was a broad uh, discussion. Dr. Cohen was a part of that discussion, um, uh, Joy Suji and, and others. And it was, uh, I think, a very good discussion of all of the various uh, uh, stakeholder positions. Um, the NRC was asked to issue a draft report. I have a copy of the draft report. It is, in fact, real. Uh, it's no longer a draft. It was released for uh, general uh, review, and it is on the NRC website. It was re released in November 7th. Um, and then the next step is that the NRC was mandated to uh, review EPA's draft, revised draft, IRIS assessment, and I'll talk with you about the timetable. Importantly, they wanted, and again, this is focused on the process. It's not focused on the science, focused on the process of uh, addressing the recommendations from previous NRC reports and ongoing NRC reports, how EPA should review literature, how EPA should conduct IRIS assessments. So there's two additional NRC reports that will come out that the EPA is going to be asked to um, uh, focus on. Uh, I'll draw your attention particularly to a focus that was addressed in the issue was um, chapter seven of the recommendations on formaldehyde where the NRC was particularly critical of EPA's IRIS approach and EPA has been, has embraced that and, and uh, we had a session with them and they recognize it and they are taking some steps to, uh, to change that. So let's talk about <clears throat> what's in this report. So um, this is a schematic that um, describes the process that the NRC committee came up with to recommend to EPA how to go about doing the um, inorganic arsenic uh, risk assessment as part of the IRIS process. First was identify the hazard. And, and I'll go through uh, most of these boxes uh, in some more detail, but I just want to lay out the, the plan. It, it, is, it is a thought to be a, just a logical stepwise approach to how you go about doing this process. And interestingly, it's quite similar uh, to what the EPA released in their draft plan for how they are going to do uh, this assessment, uh, and the two are, are actually quite similar. This schematic is right from this report, so it is in the report. So first of all, hazard identification. I'm not going to talk about step two, but it's hugely important, hugely important to do this right. 
Um, there's a massive body of literature out there. There are tens of thousands of reports in the literature on toxicology, toxicity of inorganic arsenic, epidemiology studies. How do you look at that literature and how do you make some sense of it to uh, make it um, so that you can begin to do this assessment of causality? Uh, just because, as Sam pointed out, just because you see an effect doesn't mean it's related to, it's a part of the adverse health outcome. Um, so how do you go about reviewing this? And there was a session at the workshop about how you do this. There's a uh, NRC report coming out as to how you do this. So there's quite a bit of attention uh, going into this uh, critical step to be able to organize and catalog uh, these uh, reports. Then there's assessment of causality. I'll talk a little bit more about that and mode of action. Uh, a very important part of this is understanding how these data um, were collected and, and, and uh, what different um, susceptible individuals uh, show after exposure to inorganic arsenic based on nutritional status, based on uh, uh, genomic uh, expression of enzymes. Uh, it's a very important uh, part of it. And I'll, fi I'll finish with um, the dose response analysis, probably the more controversial aspect of this, both within the NRC uh, process and talking about, uh, talking about this with EPA. So here are the hazard identification points that are a part of the NRC recommendation. We looked at the global body of data, and a large part of this report is devoted to these health outcomes. And this is, this is, as I said, there's a huge body of data. And with the panel that we had, there's lots of experience with these different health outcomes. It's, it's almost overwhelming to look at this. How is EPA in a finite period of time going to look at this? Because remember, it's not cancer endpoints only now. It's everything that's associated with uh, inorganic arsenic toxicity. Um, so we prioritized it. Based on the strength of the evidence, this is our own interpretation, the committee's interpretation, based on how, how we think the EPA uh, should begin to look at this as they think about where do I put my efforts and how do I begin to do this. So tier one is um, evidence of causal association that's determined by other agencies and generally recognized. And you'll see the, bladder, the, the cancer outcomes that Sam talked about, lung, skin, and bladder, there's no question about the fact that high exposures in these endemic areas where, where arsenic exposure is endemic, uh, arsenic is clearly associated with an increased incidence of these diseases. Same thing with ischemic heart disease and skin lesions. The second tier is where the data are less clear, and it may not only come from epidemiology data. A lot of the data comes from epidemiology. There's also data from animal studies um, and some in vitro studies where it's important, it's interesting, it's maybe not as compelling as tier one, but it's important for EPA to take a look at. And then the last tier is where the data are a little bit less clear, uh, the evidence is less strong, um, but uh, we feel it was important for the agency to consider this in the overall IRIS assessment. Again, these three tiers, everything I've shown you so far, is a part of this um, document that was released by the NRC. Um, so let's talk about some more steps in this process. First of all, uh, assessment of causality. Once this huge assessment of the data and this uh, categorization, collation of the data, how do you understand whether or not the effects that were observed in these epidemiology studies are in fact related to the exposure? Uh, so there's a process that uh, we have recommended uh, that they go through. And, and EPA, this is nothing new uh, to EPA. They have also put this forward in their um, draft plan. Uh, there's five categories that they are using to categorize these events from clearly associated to possibly associated, suggestive to not associated, clearly not associated. Um, they're looking at a comprehensive uh, examination of the available literature, and this will be based on the weight of, of that they place on the individual studies, how well those studies are done. And we can talk a little bit about that um, in the discussion if you want. Using this, uh, using the Bradford Hill criteria, many of you are familiar with this, a very systematic approach to how you determine whether or not the event that you observe is related causally to the exposure. Uh, and so we've, we've uh, made it quite clear that we expect this, and this was also part of the uh, Chapter 7 of the formaldehyde report. And importantly, it's, a, it's a recognized that this is, a, is still is, is an emerging field. There's many, many health outcomes that are not that well characterized. Mode of action is very poorly understood, and there will be data gaps 
and a need for prioritization for subsequent mode of action or dose response analysis. The mode of action analysis is something that uh, we spent an awful lot of time talking about. This is the chapter that I mentioned that Yvonne Dragon uh, drafted. Um, I think it's quite good, but that's because I helped her uh, with the commentary on it. But um, I think it's a very important uh, part of this uh, overall process. The key elements that are, and it, this is important, it is going to be limited to those events that are determined to have a causal or likely to be causal relationship to inorganic arsenic exposure. It may also be used for those endpoints where there's suggestive evidence of causality. Um, the EPA has made it very clear that irrespective of whether or not there is an understanding of molecular initiating events, if the observation is real in a strong, well-conducted epidemiology study, they will do dose response analysis on that, independent of understanding mode of action analysis, mode of action. Um, a key part of this relationship we spent a lot of time talking about this, is that this is dependent on understanding of the exposure response relationship, not the input dose, but the exposure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Using a comprehensive assessment of the data, not just looking at epidemiology data, but looking at animal data in vivo, looking at in vitro data, understanding what evidence there is to relate the event um, at the site of action to exposure to that agent. And the key question, and this is something that is, uh, is central and this is really my uh, emphasis uh, to you, is that are the exposures that are achieved, exposures that are achieved sufficient to trigger those key biological events that underline the, uh, the health outcome? And that's going to be very difficult for many of these uh, less well-studied uh, endpoints. Dose response analysis, um, a, a key part and one of the last, one of the final steps in the process that we have recommended. Um, uh, most of the effort will be epidemiologic. Uh, the committee made it very clear and the EPA has made it very clear that because of the vast amount of epidemiologic data, um, it, arsenic is unique, inorganic arsenic is unique. Uh, where many chemicals, there's very little good epidemiology data for inorganic arsenic, it's the opposite. So most of the weight of evidence, most of the evidence that they're going to use is going to come from uh, epidemiologic data. Uh, in many cases, meta-analyses will be uh, recommended if there are two or three or more good epidemiology studies that can be combined in a web meta-analysis, uh, and there are some clear criteria for how you can combine those. Um, below the observed range, and this is a key point of concern uh, for this, uh, below the observed range when the epide epidemiology data are inadequate, we recommended that mode of action data be used. Again. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging because for these non-cancer endpoints, as Sam said, there is most likely a mechanism, but there are very little data to support uh, much of that. Uh, analyses, the dose response analyses, as I said, should be they will perform those even in the absence of a clear understanding of molecular initiating events. Um, and a key part of the recommendation, a key part of the chapter, I recommend you to read this chapter is that in the absence of mode of action data, alternative statistical modeling approaches uh, will be used. And I'll give you some examples of that. There's some good, I believe, some good criteria for how and when you can use that modeling criteria and when it fits and when it works and when it doesn't. And I think uh, that will be a basis of discussion, I would expect, with the, with the EPA. So that's what's in the report. Now, the rest of this I'm going to talk uh, largely about my own uh, views of this. These are my thinking about what, is, what are the important considerations in looking at inorganic arsenic uh, toxicity assessment. What do you have to, to, to do? The key one to me is the adequacy of the data on exposure. Uh, Sam talked to you about the metabolism. I'll show you a slide in a minute that just reemphasizes that point. Very complex. Uh, very dependent, uh, very highly variable across the human population, um, uh, understanding what the exposure to the key uh, trivalent metabolites are at the site of action um, is very challenging. It's, it's very challenging, and, and I think that the, we're going to find that there's just not a lot, a lot of data there. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about concomitant exposures, lead and selenium, uh, where there is high endogenous exposure to um, Inorganic arsenic, there is generally a high exposure to cadmium, uh, to lead, and those co-exposures are very important in understanding the, the health outcome. 
Uh, cigarette smoking, uh, particularly at the high end of the dose response curve, has clearly been associated with an exacerbation of inorganic arsenic toxicity. So how do you dial that out uh, is clearly important. And you'll hear more from Dr. Hall about nutritional status, uh, particularly uh, folate status. Um, and what are the outcomes that we're looking at? Uh, uh, how sensitive is blood pressure? If you're looking at uh, inorganic arsenic as hypertensive, one paper, for example, that we spent some time talking about measures pulse pressure. Not diastolic blood pressure, not systolic blood pressure, but pulse pressure. How relevant is that to understanding whether or not you have a, an adverse health outcome. And there's going to be some difficulties with that. And also looking at sensitive populations, uh, neonatal exposure, uh, young children exposure, uh, old age, uh, and different uh, disease states is, is important. I just want to reemphasize the complexity of the metabolic profile, going from the pentavalent to the, um, the reduction from the pentavalent to the trivalent. And, and it's the, the, uh, a key enzyme is this arsenic um, uh, three-methyltransferase. Uh, that is, and, and the availability of this uh, single carbon donor, s adenosyl methionine. Uh, did I do that? No. Uh, but the, the availability of s adenosyl methionine is, is critically important uh, to the function of that enzyme. And it is, as you'll hear from Dr. Hall, it is influenced by nutritional status. There is also a tremendous variability in um, uh, genomic. Uh, 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 population-wide genomics. Some people have higher levels of the enzymes. In some cases, it's expressed more uh, uh, completely than in others or uh, more dramatically than in others. And what happens is that you have uh, a higher proportion of these uh, highly reactive trivalent methylated forms, the monomethyl, and I don't show it here, but the dimethyl can also be reduced to the um, uh, or the dimethyl pentavalent can be reduced to the dimethyl trivalent, which is also a highly reactive species. So the point of this slide for me is I think it's important to understand the concentration of these entities at the site of action, wherever that may be for diabetes, for neurodevelopmental uh, defects, and I think those are the very real challenges uh, that, that this whole process is going to face. Um, I've talked a little bit about this, some of the metabolic, uh, um, the um, females seem to be more effective than males in methylation, and methylation, as Sam mentioned, to the dimethyl, particularly the, the uh, pentavalent form, um, seems to detoxify. Poor methylators uh, seem to show a higher level of toxicity. Uh, understanding that and understanding the proportion of those different forms of inorganic arsenic, in my view, as a blood and guts toxicologist is hugely important in understanding uh, causality and, and mode of action. And I talked a little bit about the trimethyltransferase. Uh, so going back to the report, uh, the committee combined a lot of these um, uh, concerns that I just expressed into what a chapter they called, we called uh, susceptibility factors. Uh, talk about uh, charging the EPA to make a, make a careful assessment of looking at uh, nutritional status, uh, understanding uh, the, the um, effect of these different uh, dietary factors on s adenosyl methionine levels and the potential to methylate, detoxify uh, the inorganic arsenic. Uh, the exposure to selenium, in many cases it's shown as, a, as a, uh, an antagonist to arsenic toxicity. It is co-located with arsenic in the Earth's crust and uh, much of this exposure. Uh, and, and different populations in different areas will have different exposures to those two uh, um, uh, elements, which can really confound uh, the effect. Um, I talked about pre-existing disease, hugely important. Um, it's very complicated because, particularly in environmental exposures, there are many metals that are co-exposed, many of which are known to be, particularly if you're talking about renal disease, the role of cadmium and mercury uh, in renal disease is well understood. Um, and, but the, the, the combined effect of these elements with arsenic is going to be a very difficult challenge uh, for the EPA to assess. And I talked about uh, the sex-related differences and life stages. Susceptibility, particularly in the pre- and the, po and the perinatal stages, is something that is becoming increasingly important. Uh, it's receiving a lot of attention. 
my view, uh, I don't believe that there's enough data there to really do something with that. So finally, just two uh, final slides on what I think are the critical issues here. Uh, as I think you gather from what I've been saying here, exposure considerations to me override everything else. It's not the dose. It's not what you are taking in. It's what the organism is exposed to. And this needs to be on an individual basis when you're looking at uh, epidemiology data, which is hugely difficult. Um, the key issue is what happens at low exposures. The NRC report uses uh, less than 100 parts per billion as low exposure. So 100 parts per billion is, is the range. So what kind of data are available in the lower end of that dose response curve? Food and well water concentration are, are very variable. If you use population studies, for example, there, these epidemiology studies, uh, and I think the people who have been doing this have recognized this, that it's very important to actually look at the individual wells that the individual people are doing. It complicates the studies uh, just enormously. What are the reliable biomarkers? And Sam touched on this. Uh, hair and nail levels are used, but that's really a measure of chronic uh, old exposure to arsenic. And understanding exposure to metabolites there is extremely difficult. Urine and blood are much better. Um, uh, plasma samples are, are uh, the technology is becoming uh, quite uh, powerful uh, to be able uh, to look at that now, but it's almost never done. Uh, it's very difficult to get these kinds of samples, particularly in the epidemiology studies, that are going to be the basis uh, for this risk assessment. And finally, this is uh, uh, an example that's taken right out of the report. Um, uh, and I want to emphasize these are hypothetical data. The, uh, the blue curve is a modeled uh, cardiovascular disease mortality based on urinary total arsenic micrograms per gram creatinine. Uh, based on the red dots are the um, so-called hypothetical observed data. And as you fit the curve, you get a 95% confidence interval of the, the reference dose. The EPA has made it very clear in their draft report that they will do a linear extrapolation uh, as a default position for all of these endpoints. What the NRC report recommends is that you have an extrapolation region that extends only one order of magnitude below the observed range. Now, in this case, that's not very dramatic. But in some cases, it can result in quite dramatic uh, differences. And I think that this is going to be, in my view, uh, again, this is a personal opinion here, uh, one of the greatest challenges that uh, the NRC will face when the EPA report uh, comes back, is understanding what these different models do to the actual risk assessment number. Next steps, the final slide. Um, the EPA is completing their review of the data. It's actually supposed to be done uh, this summer. Uh, we know that they are actively engaged in that. We don't know the details of it at this point. Um, and we expect a draft of this risk assessment either by the end of this year or early uh, 2015. When I talked to the NRC group about what this date was, they wanted me to be a little soft uh, on that because it is not, uh, it, it has not been committed. And we understand it. it's, it's just a massive task. It is, in, in, in the deference to the EPA, it is a massive task to get on top of this and do it right. So I would say end of 2014, early uh, 2015. Then we will review and comment on the draft. And the uh, tentative uh, plan is to have the NRC uh, report on the EPA draft available on the NRC website in 2016, early 2016. So with that, I'll end. And I'll say thank you very much and uh, ask any answer any questions I can. Thank you.